There's a few speakers in to discuss their experiences of being uh, present and former PhD students. And just to start off, I'm going to give an introduction about our chapter, what we're about, what we do, and why hopefully you should consider becoming a member in the future. So we're a joint association from SIAM, which is the Society of Industrial and Applied Mathematics, and the IMA. Uh, SIAM are a global organization, the IMA are a more UK organization. We're a joint chapter, and we really, really hope that if anyone's interested in attending today's conference, that they consider becoming a member of SIAM and of our chapter, if you're associated with a Dublin university. We also have, um, there's also chapters associated with um, Galway and Limerick, uh, which I'd hope you consider joining as well if you're joining us from those regions. Uh, we have a QR code there, which you can scan or visit our website. Uh, we have a YouTube channel and a Twitter account as well, which uh, I think some of my colleagues will link in the chat to you guys now. Um, and please feel free to like and subscribe to us on those platforms. Um, the more members we have, the merrier, and we're open to everybody. So anyone who's any interest at all in applied maths in Dublin uh, and wants to find out more, please feel free to join us. And what I want to do now is talk about some of the past events we've organized. So we're, we're a relatively new chapter. We were only signed up really in, a, in last year. And of course, coronavirus has affected us uh, in all the ways you'd expect. A lot of our society events are now online. However, that hasn't really stopped us from hosting some very successful events over the past year. Um, so every year there's an annual SIAM student chapter conference. We hosted last year's version in December. And that was very nice. If you're an early career researcher, PhD student, um, it's a very good opportunity to present your work. And in fact, even this year, we had a section for undergraduate students. So if you do, and hopefully that'll be an ongoing thing in the future. So if you are interested and you're an undergraduate PhD level student, and you want to present your research in a friendly atmosphere, I definitely get, recommend getting in touch. Next year's event, we have some of our talks actually on, uh, on YouTube if you want to get a kind of a flavor of what was presented at last year's conference. We also have a student journal club. Um, so we presented some versions of that last year. It's a very informal setting. We just discuss papers that we've read that we're interested in, not necessarily to do with our main research, um, just generally things we found interesting. Everyone's welcome to come to those. It, and again, it's a very laid back informal chat about um, kind of things we found interesting that were, that were published. We have mini seminar series on YouTube that's been members of our chapter so far discussing what their research is. Uh, so mostly PhD students so far that have discussed their research. Again, feel free to go to that link. Um, very popular series we've had so far of industry talks. We've had, uh, recently we had Benoit Derin from uh, Google DeepMind. He was talking about regularization and deep learning. That was a very popular talk. And he was a very interesting guy. We also had Dr. Sarah Gallagher, head of observations from MedAaron in talking to us. And we're hoping to organize more of those events in the future. Definitely recommend coming to those. They give a good idea of kind of careers and maths, what you can do in the future. Um, but we'll also hear that from our PhD students as well later today. We're hoping as well, uh, which I'll touch on in a second, to have a speaker in from iCheck quite soon, the Irish Centre for High-End Computing. Uh, last year, we also hosted an undergraduate talk competition, which had some nice prizes for undergraduate mathematics students in Ireland, so all over Ireland, who could present um, possibly final research, final year research projects or uh, theses that they've presented, maybe internship, projects that they've worked on. And we had some really good talks last year who entered, and we're hopefully gonna run that again this year in, in August, but we'll release further details of that closer to the time. On the week of the 5th of April, we're going to host our AGM and the nominations are open now. So we're gonna host an event. This is our annual general meeting, but we're also going to have voting for our committee for the upcoming year. So, if you're interested in getting involved with our committee, please um, scan this QR code or go to the link and you'll be uh, directed to the positions that you can apply for. So we have five positions open. Currently, I'm the treasurer, uh, Enda Carl from UCD is our president, and these positions will be open again from next year. And we like to have a good mix of the Dublin universities in, involved 
uh, in these positions. So if you want to find out more information, just go to those links. Feel free to do so. Or just get in touch with us uh, through any of our channels. So uh, we thought we'd kick off today's chat um, by just going through very briefly the um, kind of the basics of a PhD, the application process. And of course, we're going to find out more information from our speakers in just a second. But uh, Nicole has presented a nice sketch of the application process for a PhD, which I'll talk you guys through. So the general application process is for the student to have a background where they have a level eight uh, undergraduate degree or higher. So again, a master's is not exactly, uh, is not required to apply for a PhD. Uh, a level eight is fine. And then you have to go down the avenue of applying for your PhD position and writing a proposal to get funding. Now, finding out about PhD positions, there's several sources of information. Uh, if you're interested, I'd, I recommend staying active on Twitter, uh, particularly through the SIAM website, SIAM feeds, links that they present. There's always PhD positions um, advertised. If there's a lecturer you have at university who can direct you towards um, uh, avenues for a PhD, I'd recommend that. Or simply through Google searches, um, um, European websites for PhDs, there's things available and I would actually really recommend that third option. So asking lecturers who perhaps um, have been down this road before and they know the steps that you need to take to go further down that road. When you write your proposal to get funding, well, there's a couple of things to consider. So first of all, there are different bodies that, that, um, that give PhD funding out. So you can either be funded by your university or you can be funded through a kind of a national body like the Irish Research Council or the Science Foundation of Ireland. Now, again, these uh, bodies change their type of PhD funding year on year, and there's different kind of there's different kind of methods for application, but really kind of depending on what year you're applying. But uh, the main takeaway from that is that there are different avenues for, for, for funding for your PhD. So the checklist to take away then would be to find a supervisor, find someone you're interested in working with at the university, uh, aim to get a first class honors or, or at least a two one in your undergraduate degree and write a funding proposal with your supervisor who um, will know a lot more about, about the process and be, will be able to guide you. And hopefully if all that's successful, it'll lead you to be a PhD student at a university. Then there's different things you're gonna do as you're a PhD student. So the particulars of these, we'll, we'll hear from our PhD panel in just a minute. However, there's plenty of things that you can get involved with. Uh, so the first thing we'd, we'd obviously recommend is getting involved with SIAM. SIAM is a, a great organization. And um, uh, of course, your main kind of the main pillar of what you're going to spend most of your time on is your own research. But there's going to be different things that's going to take up your time. You're going to carry out research and meet with your supervisor uh, on a fairly regular basis. But you're also during the year gonna present your research at many seminars and conferences. And again, this is one of the main benefits of becoming a SIAM member, uh, that you're aware of these kinds of seminars and conferences, uh, the most relevant ones for you to present your research at. You're also going to uh, continue your learning by taking advanced courses in your chosen subject by attending summer schools. Usually during a PhD, you're also going to tutor. So you're going to do some lecturing or teaching. Uh, tutorials for undergraduates is usually the way you proceed with this. And there's also other ways of, of continuing outreach in science. So you can um, get involved with SIAM events. There's also events like Bright Club, which is kind of a mix of, of uh, comedy and science and um, soapbox science. So there's loads of different events that you can get involved with. So it's not just uh, mathematical research that you'll be involved with, although that will be your main kind of um, duty as a PhD student. Okay, I think that was all the slides we had prepared as an introduction. So without further ado, I'm going to jump back now and I'm going to get to introducing our PhD students. So on the panel here today, we have Roisin Hill from NUI Galway. She started her PhD in 2017. And her focus is on the design, implementation, and application of moving mesh methods with problems for problems with layer phenomena. 
We also have Ryan Smith from UCD. He started in 2019. He is, so both of these are current PhD students. Uh, he's interested in the simulation of fluids and combining modern machine learning and image processing techniques to find new ways to study the dynamics of breathing waves. And we have Paul O'Reilly from, well, when he graduated with DIT, but at TU Dublin now, <laughs> he graduated in 2017. And his research interest was the mathematical modeling of optical, optical patterning in photopolymer systems. Sorry, a bit of a, <laughs> should have pronounced that a bit better. Um, okay, I think we might start off the discussion with uh, talking a bit about the background to your PhD. So if we could start with you, Roisin, I wonder what was your motivation for doing the PhD? Or could you talk a little bit about why you wanted to do a PhD? When did you know it was something you'd be interested in? Well, my route isn't the standard route. I went back to education in 2013 and did an undergrad in maths because my daughter had started an undergrad the previous year and I just loved the work she was doing and got very interested in it. So I did an undergrad from 2000, 2013. And then in 2017, on the completion of that, I started my PhD. But part of the motivation was in the summer of my third year, which was be 2016 of my undergrad, I did a summer internship as well, which was, um, I think it was only five weeks long, but I really enjoyed that. It was just research based and that was sort of part of my motivation. And I had also found someone, kind of a lecturer in NUIG that I really would like to work with. You know, we got on really well. We were both interested in kind of the same sort of stuff. And mine is really, it's very um, application based. So it's a lot of it is programming. And I really kind of fell in love with the pro programming and the, the applied math side of it really of my degree. My degree is undergrad degree was a math science degree. So I had a lot of flexibility. It's a degree that, you know, after the first year where your modules are set or near enough set, after that, you can kind of head towards whichever you like. Like you can do more pure maths, applied maths and scientific computing or statistics, depending on what where your interests lay. So I kind of once I'd done the summer internship, I said, yeah, I just love to keep going at this and, and do a PhD. And I really enjoyed it. I'd be, Still, it's really enjoying it. It's it's hard work. It's there's a lot of work in it, but it's it's very it's very rewarding. I, I really like it, and just I like the environment in NUI Galway, even though I haven't been there in over a year now. But other than that, so that's really what my motivation was. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. It's hard to create the atmosphere uh, online, but that's yeah. really interesting to hear. So we don't have the you know the conventional kind of PhD line that most people might think but uh it's great to hear that there's other roots into it one thing i actually noticed in the chat kirk's reminded me of it and i forgot to say it uh, if any students in the, in the audience today do have any questions that they'd like to ask our speakers we're going to have lots of time for those kind of questions and um, i think the best route will be to directly message kirk with your questions so kirk you might see him he's on screen don't worry he's very friendly uh he'll take your questions and pass them on to me at the end and uh, i think that'll be that'll be probably the nicest way to do it well, brilliant. Thanks for that, Roisin. Um, Ryan, if I was to move on to you, I'm going to ask you kind of the same question. So what was your motivation behind the PhD? And was there a particular kind of thing that springboarded you on, like Roisin's internship, anything like that? Um, so I went straight from my bachelor's as well into the PhD after graduating in, in 2019. Um, I suppose the first thing that turned me on to research was uh, the thesis project that I did for my undergrad. I found that I, I really enjoyed kind of reading the latest papers, but as, as you find out during the PhD, it's not just about reading, it's about actually working on and creating research as well. And um, I suppose, yeah, when, when I, I, I really enjoyed that kind, that kind of research project. And, and so that's what kind of uh, led me to, to considering the PhD. Um, I'm in uh, one of the CRTs, which is a, a center for research training. So I didn't uh, exactly know the kind of research area that I was going into straight away. I got to keep my, my options uh, more broad and open during the, the first year of my research uh, and, and selecting a supervisor uh, in that way as well. Um, so again, it's a, a slightly different way than maybe the more conventional PhDs again. Uh, uh, in, in that sense. Very good, yes. And uh, yeah, that might be something we touch on later on as well, because yeah, the Centre for Doctoral Training, that's a slightly different route than what Rogine has explored. 
and what I think Paul is going to touch on now in a second. Um, so very interesting. Yeah, that might be something that we come back to. And I think that theme of the undergraduate thesis pushing people on to do further research, getting them first involved, is uh, will be a common theme as well. And if I was to put the same question to you, Paul, um, would you be able to tell us a bit about your background? Was doing a PhD something you were always interested in, or was it something you kind of discovered more as you were an undergraduate? Yeah, I suppose it's something that you definitely discover more. I don't think most people go into their undergraduate from uh, the leave insert saying, I can't wait to do a doctorate. But um, similar to uh, both Roisin and Ryan, I went straight from my undergraduate and really it was kind of a function of two things. Primarily, it was uh, like I was enjoying the environment I was in. Um, I had a choice really at that point about going out, obviously, into the, the workforce or doing a master's. Um, I kind of felt like I wanted to move on from even in a master's, it's kind of a bit more like module based as opposed to trying to figure things out yourself, project based. So that's what pushed me into the PhD. Um, it was also like, because as, as you mentioned earlier, like I started that in 2012. So the economy wasn't a great place either. So it was kind of a, that was kind of a nice added benefit that, you know, you kind of could work on something that, maybe in the future w would add a lot to you um, without having to kind of go out and face the big bad world straight away. So, you know, it was nice to be able to stay in that environment um, a little bit longer. Very good, very interesting, yes. And I was gonna say, I was gonna ask Roshin, you mentioned that you had, um, you had a good relationship with your supervisor. You had him as a lecturer when you were an undergraduate mm -hmm. and um, that kind of led you on to um, having an interest in continuing to work and do a PhD. So can I ask a bit more about that kind of, uh, how did that contact work? So did you contact him or did he mention to you that doing a PhD was going to be something? I, I don't actually remember now. Um, <laughs> well, uh, he was my lecturer for um, both uh, numerical analysis and scientific computing, which is what my PhD is on. So I kind of had a real interest in, in that. I, I actually don't know which of us said it first, but yeah, it was... And I ended up by just sheer chance uh, doing my uh, final year project as well with him, because in Galway, you get to pick three, lect three lectures to do it with, and you're just assigned one randomly. So I ended up being assigned him as well for that. So at that stage, I definitely knew like that, that we worked really well together and that it was, you know, that he was somebody that I felt I could definitely work with for four years without getting frustrated in things. Whereas what I found with some of, you know, well, not everyone, but you know, you have some lecturers and like one, for example, whenever I said I was interested in doing a final year project with them said, oh, come and meet me. And I let at such and such a time and I ended up standing outside his office for half an hour because he'd completely forgotten it. But those people, for me personally, that, that would frustrate me. Whereas I wouldn't have that, I don't have that issue in any way. Like it's, he's, like Neil is great. He's always there when he need, you know, you know, he'd, he'd never sort of set, forget you or stand you up or anything like that so it works really well and he's always contactable as well so you really to me kind of that relationship was very important to me that it was somebody that I felt very comfortable with asking questions about problems and also he was quite he would have been he would also say to me you know you, you should figure that out yourself and that's something that's very important for me as well like to know what you should be doing and then to know if you're going to, you know, there's no point in spending enough lot of time on something as well that's that's of no benefit. So he'd be really good at things like that as well, to sort of telling you where, you know, where you're best spend your, spend your time and, you know, which is also very important for me. But. Yeah, of course. That sounds like a very, very fruitful relationship. Yeah, that was getting off on the wrong foot, definitely, leaving you, leaving you waiting outside. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose that's, a, that's one of the advantages of a PhD, though, isn't it? That you can kind of, to a certain extent, you're kind of picking your own boss for the next four years. And so yeah. if you have a good relationship with someone, you can, you can actively seek to extend that, you know? Yeah, definitely. And, uh, yeah, I suppose with Ryan, with you, it was a little bit different because you didn't know who your supervisor was going to be, if I'm correct, before you entered the Centre for Doctoral Training. Is that correct? Yeah, that's uh, correct. So... Um... Just as a as a bit of background to the the CRT, we we, we go in and we start off some group projects uh, under some supervisors, but and we use that first kind of semester or, or to to kind of uh, get in contact with a supervi supervisory body and uh, ask questions about the research that they are they are proposing for projects there as well. 
Um, so the, the first semester within the CRT is very much uh, searching around and, and finding uh, some projects to work on. Okay, very good, very good. And, and Paul, when you were, I suppose you were an undergraduate in CU Dublin and, and, and then you probably probably had an initial contact with Donna during that stage. Um, was, did you approach her to ask about the offer PhD opportunities or how, how did that initial contact work? Um, I had asked around um, both external to TUD and internal of different people, uh, including Donna. Um, and it actually just worked out that I returned one of my, my other lecturers uh, was a previous student at that time just finishing. So the stars aligned a little bit that uh, one student finished and, and that gap opened, um, as well as kind of asking around that at seeing what other kind of options were available. Um, we had, I had enjoyed some of the lectures, like the classes I had with Dana over the previous two years. Um, so that it kind of, as I said, yeah, just aligned that had it been a, a semester off, it probably wouldn't have worked out as well. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I definitely think that uh, when you take someone's class and you see how they work, it gives you an idea of how, you know, you might get on with someone in the, in the PhD sense. And uh, and yeah, that might lead to uh, to uh, collaboration with them. Um, I suppose I wanted to move on now to kind of so that was kind of the background to your PhD, Roshin. I was going to touch now on on kind of ongoing research, and I know this will probably have changed since COVID. So, you know, take that with a bit of salt. But what's a typical what's a typical day like for you as a PhD student? Well, as you say, there, there's a mixture, and like you have definitely like do tutorials sometimes as well. Um, I supervise computer labs, but the main bulk of you says of my time is spent researching. So with me, a lot of my research is um, computer based. So I'm sort of writing programs, running them, getting numerical results, checking them, rerunning and changing kind of parameters. Nicole's not in her head, she knows all about it. <laughs> changing the parameters and running it again and then writing up the information that you've come you know when you're happy then with results you've got or whatever writing it all up and then thinking of how can I improve this how can I further this into another stage and then back again so usually I'm either kind of writing python programs or I'm in LaTeX that would be most of my research time is spent doing that and then of course also reading papers you know finding out what thing, what else is going on in the research world as well Okay, yeah, so that's really the kind of uh, the nuts and bolts of what, of what research is doing. You have, your, you have your programming set up open, but you're also reading papers. And I suppose it's quite similar day to day for you, for you Ryan. Uh, uh, I, I presume, yeah, feel free to correct me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the, the research is obviously composed of uh, writing, reading, and uh, tearing your hair out, trying to program stuff. Um, the, that, that is uh, what, what uh, it's kind of composed of for our, our um, computer-based uh, research. Um, but then yeah, also you find a lot of the time you can uh, be, as, as is Roisin said, tutoring or attending the seminars that you might have organized within your school or other events and, uh, and things like that as well. So uh, there, there's a lot that uh, makes up every day. Yeah, and, and that, that's actually something we'll come back to now in a second. So kind of teaching and seminars and, and kind of the other responsibilities apart from, you know, the main applied maths research. Um, and I suppose, Paul, if I could get you to think back to your life as a PhD student, I suppose we kind of hear a similar, a similar story from you. And I suppose I, I was kind of, um, to, to delve a little bit more into it, I'm interested as well, how much kind of, how much teaching, how much other teaching and things did you do as, an, as a PhD student? And how did you balance that with um, with uh, your main research? Yeah, um, I think on the research side, most of my experience is, uh, you know, is, is reading, um, at least for the first, for anyone here who's looking to be a new student, my, my experience for the first year or two was just reading and, you know, looking at how other people solve problems. Um, I think you'd almost, you know, in hindsight, underestimated that coming in, you know, that you would think it would all be the, the really fun coding. Um, when you're coding, you kind of know what you're doing. <laughs> and when you're reading, you don't know what you're doing. So I would say most of my time was spent feeling completely clueless. Like and I had, I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, anyone here would, uh, who's lucky to do a PhD, you know, if you start, bear in mind, that's a very normal feeling to say, you know, I haven't got a clue what I'm doing and how. Uh, and I think, you know, 
80% or 90% of the progress was made in the last 18 months. Um, and in the first three and a half years was completely and utterly you know, useless dead time. Um, obviously not useless, but you know, it's, it's not linear. It's not like, oh, you come up in every day, you know, you just lay a brick down and, and it, you know, this march of progress. Um, my experience is a bit different as well. I, I didn't have funding um, at all. So uh, DIT was very good that it uh, essentially gave me very cheap uh, self-funding rate. I paid, I was less than 2,000 euro a year. I think it might be less, I think it might have been 1,500 euro a year. So it wasn't, it wasn't too prohibitive. Um, and I was young and uh, DIT, the, the head of school, kind of organized me to get a fair bit of teaching hours. Um, it essentially meant like I was working two full-time jobs. Um, if anyone is considering teaching, it's very fortunate to do maths because I started off doing a few tutorials, but then the School of Business needed help and the School of Computing needed help and the School of Engineering needed help. Um, so I was able to self-fund myself for, kind of for, for a few years off that. It did obviously mean you know, working like more than uh, a normal 40 hour job, but it, it is possible. Um, so yeah, just being a little bit frugal and, and, and working like that. But yeah, that, that was my experience of teaching as well. <laughs> okay, yeah, that's good to hear because I think some of the students in attendance might have, might have been wondering about that as well, about uh, you know additional income that you can earn during the PhD outside of maybe your base funding that there will be teaching opportunities um, made available to you. And I was kind of, I suppose, um, I was interested in that kind of, if you can think back to before you started your PhD, uh, Roshni, and I'll come back to you, um, kind of, I wanted to know about kind of the additional tasks and duties that you do as a PhD student now that you didn't really expect to do before you started. Um, I wonder, did you expect to have this amount of teaching? Did you know fully what you were getting into or did kind of more things arise as you as you went through your PhD? I would say in general, I knew what I was getting myself into because I knew some of the current PhD students in NUI Galway at the time. So I knew what their kind of their own extra responsibilities were, as you say, like teaching, attending seminars, giving, giving presentations, doing things like this, you know, just doing all the other little ad hoc stuff. And um, one of the other things in Galway is that we have a math support centre as well. So you spend like do kind of three hours a week in that where you're kind of helping mainly first year and second year undergrads with kind of maths issues, whatever their maths problems and, and we'll say the mature access students as well. You know, people that are coming in kind of alternative route than coming straight from secondary school. So we spent, spent time on that, but I would have known all of that before I started because I, I made a point of finding it out. Not before I started my undergrad, I wouldn't have had a clue what was involved, but by the time I got interested in doing a PhD, I knew what I was, I had a good idea what I was letting myself in for. Okay, yeah, so you've done the background work. I, mean, I think <laughs> probably more than me before I had gone in. <laughs> Plus, uh, I, yeah. yeah, I suppose, and the other thing was I was staying in the same university as well, so I was kind of aware of how, how it worked there, whereas maybe if I'd gone somewhere else to do it, I wouldn't have had this, the same amount of information and things might have been worked differently there. Sure, yeah, and I think there is a benefit to kind of having that corporate knowledge, having that insider information, you know, just of how things work. Yeah. But um, so that's an interesting point. Yeah. I wonder, Ryan, did you know fully about the kind of additional task duties you were expected to do as a PhD student or was it a little bit new? Did you have to figure things out as you went along? Um, yeah. So I, I think I anticipated uh, some tutoring duties, uh, duties anyway. Um, I think with the, the move to online kind of teaching, that is a uh, the time that that takes has kind of slightly increased uh, with correcting, you know, you're downloading uh, files and clicking and scrolling through things and it's a bit harder to mark them and, and keep track of everything there. Um, so yeah, yeah, I an anticipated a, co a couple of hours a week uh, dedicated to that. Um, I think I probably hadn't uh, thought about all of the seminars that would be attending kind of, are they a break up the day and, and things like that as well. So there's uh, there are things to kind of break up the day and, and get you out of your office or um, maybe you're, you're still sitting at your desk uh, at home all day anyway. But um, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, maybe uh, uh, it's a little bit more time consuming, all those other tasks than you, you would think uh, 
you, sometimes some days it's hard to find time to do the research and, and things like that. Um, uh, so yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a good point. I think uh, because everything's online, sometimes you can kind of overstretch all the things you try and attend in one day and don't really, you know, it can be hard to judge how long things are going to take. Um, so actually, Paul, I'll come back to you now. I suppose you've already talked a little bit about your teaching. Um, so I kind of want to touch on a slightly different aspect. So Ryan was mentioning about seminars and uh, I suppose just conferences in general um, and kind of experiences you had during the PhD. I wonder if you were to think back and say kind of like what was maybe the best or what was one of the best experiences you had during your PhD, maybe a conference you attended, a summer school uh, or something else, I don't know. Uh, can, you, can you talk us through any of those? Yeah, sure. Um, I think overall, like the best, like the best takeaway I'd have, and I think anyone consider doing a PhD would need to consider this, is that you're sort of surrounded by people like on every day um who are doing research and you know who are just generally curious people and i think like that to me was a huge factor like that i shared a, an office i think there might have been even more than 10 of us in it um computer science students uh i've regularly met kind of engineering phds uh mphils um maths and everyone was talking about their individual projects but also people were talking about other interesting things um I spent quite a while talking to a, a Russian postdoc about uh, Ukrainian politics, and I think he was also telling me about chess strategies. Um, and these are things that, you know, me and this kind of host of different people from around the world, but also people solving and looking at problems in different ways. Um, to me, I think that that's something that I would not have got without, um, without being there. And I think some people here, unfortunately, the last year work from home, maybe have missed that. Um, but yeah, and then the same goes true for conferences, seminars. They just always meet in different people um, who are solving different types of problems. And that, that to me is what I found interesting, you know, just even going to a conference and got looking at poster presentations and just, you know, seeing what's going on, you know? Yeah, the, that kind of stimulating atmosphere can be a real, can be a real benefit from doing a PhD. And yeah, I suppose that, little, that social aspect is kind of missing from working from home. Um, I wonder, Roshan, if I was to put that same question to you, was is there any highlights so far or huge kind of, you know, best events you've attended, best experience so far? Well, one of the best experiences I had was I got to go to Banff in Canada and it's absolutely gorgeous. It's up in, it's in the Rockies. It, the setting is just something out of this world. And I was supposed to go in a couple of months time again, which of course isn't going to happen. And but yeah, the travel was fantastic. And even my very first conference that I ever went to was in Oxford and I went on my own. And it's actually on again this week. So I'm at, at that, that's on virtually this week. So I'm at that all, all from one o'clock to nine every evening as well this week. But it was absolutely lovely. I ended up arriving the first night and I knew someone that was in Oxford and we went for dinner. And on the way back, we met some of the pe people that were in the conference. And they took me under their kind of wing for the rest of the, the week. And it was just absolutely amazing. And as you say, you get to meet all, all of these people are, they're all interesting. Like you can, it's so easy to talk to people about anything because, you know, kind of even meeting all of you at times at all the, the kind of the, our own conferences. It's, it's, it's lovely. The, and as you say, yeah, what, what Paul said is right. You do definitely get to meet much more interesting people doing a PhD or as you say, inquisitive people and things like that, that. Yeah, it's, it is really interesting, that side of it. But I really miss not being kind of, like I wouldn't have went to Galway every day anyway, but I used to love the days I went to Galway where even was if we had a PhD, kind of like a coffee room, tea room, where everyone would meet for lunch. And as Paul says too, like the, just the conversation could be could be about absolutely anything. It could be about specifically about research. It could be people, there was whiteboards, somebody could be up on a whiteboard saying, look, if this problem has anyone any thoughts and, you know, anything from that to just talking about. Telling you a problem you have and, in a year's time you could have the same problem but you now know how to deal with it whereas currently if you have a problem there's no one to talk to about them really yeah definitely it's hard to recreate that online it's amazing how, how often those bouncing ideas off someone over a yeah. coffee turns out to solve solve the problem you're yeah. working on definitely yeah 
And for any kind of, for any students attending today, that might be something you're interested in, but there, you know, once you get PhD funding, you know, it depends on what funding body you have, but there, you will get a certain amount for travel and what, and international travel attending conferences is definitely one of the huge pluses. As Roshan says, they're attending conferences in Canada. And while that may be a little bit daunting, uh, you definitely, people take you under their wing. Yeah. It's very, very welcoming and friendly. And uh, I, hope, I hope that was the same experience you've had, Ryan, so far, maybe attending conferences. Uh, or what was, what's kind of been a highlight so far of your PhD? Um, so I haven't been able to attend any in-person conferences uh, starting in the September of 2019. Uh, I did get to have one uh, short trip to Paris uh, on March 10th, which I believe was the week that uh, UCD actually closed for COVID then. Um, so I spent uh, one or two days in Paris visiting collaborators there. Um, I will have the opportunity to go back there as part of a, a shorter kind of placement as well, maybe about uh, three months uh, to spend there, hopefully in the summer of next year. Um, so I hope to be able to do some of the tra traveling there again. Um, but yeah, uh, no in-person conferences yet uh, on my side. Um, <laughs> That sounds very exciting if it happens. Yeah, that'll be a definite highlight of the PhD time. I have actually, I see um, Kirk's passed me on some questions from some students who were in attendance. So I think I'll start with you, Paul, put this question to you. We've had a question in from a student who wanted to know about, uh, I suppose, about your background confidence in your maths knowledge uh, and your work ethic when you were first applying. I suppose if you were a little kind of doubting that in yourself, and if you're if the student's interested in a PhD, but uh, finds the whole idea of it very intimidating, uh, from a kind of from the very structured undergraduate to kind of the more fluid world of a PhD, where you have to it's it's more self-directed. Uh, I think you'd agree. Uh, so kind of how did you if you can take yourself back to the start of the PhD? Were there did you did you doubt your ability at any stage, uh, or did you go through that same thought process? Yeah, well, like, I mean, I don't think anyone does a PhD without, um, about doubting themselves pretty much at every point, you know, I think everyone as well goes through a period, uh, you know, Ryan's probably coming up to it now where you start thinking that you'll never finish and you're definitely going to quit. Um, and then you get to the point where you absolutely can't quit because, you know, you've, you've put too much time into this. Um, so, you know, it's a mixed bag of emotions. Um, I would say that it's more of a marathon than a sprint. You know, you, you literally have four years to build up that knowledge, um, that expertise. You if you know, I was fortunate to have a great supervisor who kind of definitely pointed me in the right direction a lot and made sure to get too lost in the weeds. But yeah, like it's it's a slow process that you know, as I said, you'll spend two and a half years, you know, completely you know, stabbing in the dark. Um, it's not wasted time because that's actually what builds up the skills to do research, or maybe that's what research is. But uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't get too caught on. I need to know everything in advance because if you knew how to do it in advance, you wouldn't be doing a PhD. Yeah, for sure. I definitely think riding over the ebbs and flows and uh, and relying on on yourself, that trusting yourself is is a big part of it. Um, I suppose, Roshin, if you were to kind of, um, if you were to think of 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 that stage when you were starting off. I'm not sure if um, perhaps maybe you went through the same thought process. Can you think of any advice that perhaps you were given or you would give to, to a student who is going through that kind of doubts perhaps? Well, there were two things. Is one, if you think of it, well, most, I think most universities do a kind of a final year project or a kind of a project in the final year that's research-based. And if you really enjoy doing that, that's that's very much that's really important if you didn't like doing that if you didn't like that because it is quite self-directed as well if you didn't like that then don't know if you're kind of you may not really want to do a research degree the other thing is is how they said as well like they're kind of the uh, the belief in their maths ability well your undergrad should be teaching showing you that if you're if you're doing well in your modules then you do have the ability to do a PhD. You don't have to be a genius and get everything right all the time. But if you're able to get, as you say, kind of either really first class honours, I think would make anyone comfortable, should be anyone getting first class honours generally across the board in their maths degree would have the, the intellectual ability. It's then to decide whether you're interested in doing the research element and then the other 
then sort of if, if you're a pure self-motivating person, if you're somebody that if no one is chasing you for a week, you'll do nothing, then you kind of have to rethink that as well, because some, some supervisors will be very hands on and other supervisors will, won't be. So you need to be able to motivate yourself, be self-motivating. That would be really the advice I'd give to anyone that they need to be that sort of person. Yeah, that's very good advice. Yeah, there is a certain you, you do have to have that certain drive, I think, to uh, kind of push things over the finish line. Um, and yeah, I suppose, Ryan, I'll come to you with a, with a, with a similar question. So I suppose, you know, if you can, if you can kind of think back and or if you were to offer advice to someone starting off or maybe considering doing a PhD, but maybe don't think they, um, they have the, the kind of ground knowledge in maths. They don't have the fundamental kind of, you know, knowledge that they need. Well, I suppose in a certain element, I mean, could you talk about, I mean, there's avenues for further learning as you do the PhD. It's not like you stop and yeah. then have to, you know, write stuff that you already know. It's like you keep learning, I suppose. Could you talk a little yeah. bit about that? Yeah, so uh, uh, I'll second everything that Roisin said, um, but also um, you don't need uh, a, a full kind of background in, in the area that you're going into, maybe. You, you've picked up some of the, the basic mathematical skills kind of uh, to cover a, a wide range of topics in your undergrad. Um, and, and you'll spend that first year, maybe year and a half reading around and getting delving into those topics and, and really getting more of the, the, the necessary skills to uh, read the literature and perform your own, your own research. Uh, to touch on the kind of doubting parts, I, I think there is, as uh, Paul said, a lot of kind of doubt you'll come across uh, during your, your uh, PhD. Um, when things aren't quite working, or as, as he said, you don't have any idea what to do at all. Um, one, one of the best pieces of advice uh, or, uh, that I think we receive probably is that you shouldn't be comparing yourself to other PhDs, uh, other PhD students, because um, progress is going to happen across those uh, projects uh, at different rates. But also you don't know where they're struggling and things like that so if you're comparing yourself to someone else so you think they're just flying along without a, a bother in the world you'll get a lot of uh, more kind of uh, self-doubts in yourself there as well so i think it's it's very important to not be kind of comparing yourself to, to the other students as well that's a very good point it's an easy trap to fall into i suppose it's the only human thing to to, to compare yourself to others but uh, i definitely I think that's good advice. And I suppose, actually, that's a, that's a good point. Um, Paul, not to put you on the spot, but if you were to think of kind of the best advice you were given as an undergraduate, maybe from Dan or maybe kind of at any stage, um, what kind of advice would you give to a PhD student? Uh, what was the best piece of advice you got? Yeah, I think it's, it's just that, that it's over and over again. You know, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. It's, uh, you know, you most people won't do to and you make three months of work in one morning one day and then you'll do nothing again for three months it, it's it's that uncertainty and i think that's what a lot of people struggle with and it's what a lot of people um yeah i think that's what you struggle with is the idea you, you you have always worked in an undergrad where you know there's a clear module there's a clear every day i come in i know that you know we're going to do every week we do one thirteenth of the course or whatever it is um here it's not like that there's you know you're you're having a coffee in the morning talking to your supervisor and you go oh like that's exactly what we're going to do um and then you know for three weeks you'll sit there just reading papers and have no clue where to go so i think that's the advice i was given is the advice that proved true to me okay very good uh, thanks for this for your answers so far. They've been really, really insightful. Uh, I think we just have a couple of questions left to go, uh, and then we'll let you get back to your to your work. I suppose, in one sense, we've talked a lot about the kind of positives of a PhD, and I want to delicately approach the uh, the other aspect. <laughs> um, Roisin, if you could change one thing about your PhD experience to date, if something could be better, if something could have been improved upon, what kind of what would that be? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a person to think like that. Really, I. I think I. I hit it really lucky. I mean, I really enjoy my research. As I say, I work really well with my supervisor, and 
Uh, oh, the one thing I would get rid of is COVID, of course, so that we could have done all our traveling and done all the things that we should have been doing for the last year. But that, no control over that. No, personally, I was just, I feel I was just really, really lucky. And yeah, uh, nothing to complain about. <laughs> <laughs> That's good to hear. And I didn't mean to put you on the spot. So now I'm hesitant to ask Brian, but uh, in the nicest way possible, Brian, <laughs> would there be anything you could think of that would change about your PhD experience today? I suppose uh, the majority of my PhD experience has again been during COVID. So that that would be the, the number one factor to change is uh, get back to the office, get back to kind of seeing people and meeting people, having those kind of uh, social experiences where you, you get to uh, have a coffee and talk over problems. and. If you are stuck on something, you can chat to the person right next to you and uh, work through it together, kind of things like that. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I suppose, Paul, you didn't you didn't have this COVID affecting you, thankfully, when you were doing your PhD. But if you could think back and if you could think, would there have been anything that could have been possibly, I don't know, improved upon or done better or maybe that you could have prep, prepared better yourself beforehand? Anything you could change about your PhD? Um, does anything come to mind? I think maybe just to have a slightly different answer. Um, you know, I, I think one thing that everyone gets caught up on, I could have seen a few questions raised on about is is the funding and the, you know, even many of my friends with PhDs in different areas, you know, were complaining about the funding element and it, it is difficult, um, but that's a short term thing. I know four years, this feels like a very long time, but especially if you're coming from an undergrad, um, and if you start your undergrad, obviously uh, straight out of school, you you really don't miss out on much. You know, like if you, it's it's not a, it's not like you're going to go into the world, you know, at 21 or 22 years old and earn six figure salary. You know, you don't feel it as bad as everyone thinks. And I think there's a lot too much focus on on the negativity there because, you know, in the long term, once it's finished, um, you know, a lot of that kind of the effects of that dissipate anyway, you know, and that, that becomes a memory. So yeah, I heard too much people worrying about that when maybe it wasn't, I mean, obviously, yeah, there's a certain degree of that, but that, that's one thing that kind of in hindsight, I wouldn't have panicked as much about. Yeah, that's an interesting aspect, I suppose. So, yeah, when, you, when you're kind of, when you're young, especially, and you're thinking of short term, you know, the opportunity cost of doing a PhD compared to, I don't know, working abroad or something like that, you know, can seem very tempting. But uh, in the long term, I definitely think, you know, you, you're not putting, you're certainly not putting yourself at a disadvantage. I think it's definitely at an advantage in the long term. And um, I suppose the last kind of topic I want to touch on is kind of um, uh, options for the future and what you think about. Uh, I know this is a this is a this is a bad question to ask PhD students because <laughs> they never know. But <laughs> maybe Roshin, you have a definite plan laid out. If I was to come to you, Russian, and say, um, what are your plans for the future? Do you have immediate plans for after your PhD? Or is that just something you don't want to think about for now? <laughs> that was the one question I says, I hope he doesn't ask. Um, I'm just very much take it as it comes. I mean, I, I'm, in, uh, I'm in a completely different place than most people finishing their PhDs in that I don't actually have to rush out and get a job after, afterwards. I mean, Work. I'm kind of financially secure. We have our own home. We have, you know, our children are growing up and we're gone, but they're now back. But, you know, they're, it's very, it's a completely different situation. What I would like to do is a postdoc, but, I'm, but I, my other issue is then I'm also very limited on where I can work. Well, maybe not anymore, considering things are moved so much online. I mean, like our family home is here. I'm not really going to kind of take off and do a, a postdoc in abroad or anything like that so and if I get one it'll have to be in Galway but that would be my hope but like at the moment like my funding is up at the end of September and there at the moment there's a chance we get four four months extra so that would bring it up into the end of January because of the effects of COVID so I'm not really not really looking at the moment too much as to what's happening afterwards because I kind of feel I'm kind of in a comfortable enough position that hopefully something will happen something will come along Hopefully. I think they will. We'll have to have you back for our Ask a Postdoc day. <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to wait. Um, yeah. Um, 
And I suppose, Ryan, it's earlier days for you in your PhD, and it probably, well, I'd actually be very surprised if you had a definite answer here, so maybe you could surprise me. But, uh, uh, what, what are you thinking, <laughs> even loosely, for the future? Uh, no, no surprises, anyway. I, um, I haven't put too much thought towards uh, what comes afterwards, and um, possibly more geared towards the, uh, the industry side of things. Um, I did do a kind of industry placement uh, just uh, ended about a month ago. So I was kind of, uh, I've got to experience kind of both sides of the thing, uh, research and industry alike. Um, so I, I no definite plans anyway. Well, I'm glad I asked you now, because I suppose a lot of undergraduates would think that a PhD would firmly lock you down the road towards academia. But I mean, it's 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 just as beneficial in industry to have a PhD, and that's probably something that Paul's going to talk about now when I ask him, because I know the answer to this question. So, Paul, uh, what did you do after you finished your PhD, and what do you do now? Uh, yeah, I went straight into industry. Um, I think I even went into industry before I'd graduated. Um, and that's to say, kind of to my last point, you know, I was originally paid a, a premium for having a PhD, particularly a PhD in maths. Um, I now work in, in tech. I work for uh, Indeed.com. I'm a data scientist with them. Um, ironically, I'm actually interviewing someone next week for a post in Dublin who has a PhD. Um, and we're very fortunate here in Ireland because there's so many tech jobs and they... They don't hire exclusive PhDs, so I, I want to be very clear on that. You could still get a job with just a bachelor's degree. Uh, a PhD is not a prerequisite, but it certainly does help. It certainly helps when they're filtering CVs. The, you know, the PhD CV gets a second look. Um, so, and that's kind of goes back to what I said earlier that, you know, you might struggle a little bit for four years, but um, yeah, if you get into a, if you go into industry and you get a tech company, it certainly will be worth it in the long run. Yes, it'll definitely stand to you. It'll definitely be beneficial and help you help you stand out from the crowd as a as a worker in industry as well. Well, guys, that was extremely illuminating, and I think we're coming up to close to time. So I think we're gonna we're gonna close things off now. Um, well, thanks a million for our three speakers for coming along. Those answers were really really interesting, really enlightening. Can we get a virtual round of applause for our three speakers? I think you might have earned a standing ovation in person, but uh, virtually it doesn't quite work. <laughs> um, let me just one more time say, if any students out there are on the fence about joining SIAM, please do follow us on our social media channels. They're in the chat. And I hope to see you guys at future events that we host. Definitely look at our Twitter feed, our website. Um, it's a very laid back atmosphere. Anyone could join. And uh, don't worry, we're very friendly and welcoming. And uh, thanks for coming along today. So once again, virtual round of applause for our speakers and I'll let you guys go.